Hey everyone, God bless you and uh, good strength on this feast of Saints Cyprian and Justina. My topic today is teetotalism. You may not even know what that is or have ever heard that word, but uh, let me explain it to you because it's a very important subject for us to address. Recently, I was having a conversation with two of my friends who are both vintners. They are both wine makers. They have vineyards and much of their love, they're both successful businessmen, but their real love is uh, in the cultivation of their own vines and the making of wine. One in the country of Georgia and one in on the island of Cyprus. And in conversations with them recently, I was stirred to, uh, to think about the dignity of winemaking and the centrality of wine uh, in the scriptures and in the story of redemption. And I'd like to, for a few minutes, talk to you about teetotalism, which is the principle that faithful Christians should not drink wine or, in fact, any alcoholic beverages ever, period, ever, period. Teetotalism rose to prominence in the 19th century. Uh, it was first mentioned and that name given to it uh, in uh, the 1830s in England uh, and uh, as part of the growing temperance movement, both in England and America, uh, many concerned citizens recognized the devastation that was brought to individuals, families, and culture itself, nations, by drunkenness. Uh, and so the concern uh, was growing in both England and in America. And it took expression uh, in these movements for temperance, uh, mostly driven by various forms of Protestant Christianity that had as its explicit goal uh, to get alcohol banned, not just by moral conviction in the lives of uh, citizens, but uh, legally. Teetotalism, that word probably comes from um, one of the uh, early temperance movements where a man who was describing his commitment, his recent commitment to uh, completely abstain from drinking any alcohol and was himself a stutterer, was trying to explain that he had embraced total temperance. And he was saying, teetotalism. And it became teetotalism. Yes, it is that way. Total temperance. This is the idea. Uh, supposedly making a vow never to drink alcohol on any occasion is a pious expression of total temperance. This is the argument that teetotalers make. Is it true? Is it true? It became very influential. In fact, this temperance movement uh, became so powerful in America that it led to the passage of the 18th Amendment in 1920 uh, that we know as Prohibition. That amendment lasted in American life for 13 years until the 21st Amendment was passed in 1933, striking down the 18th Amendment. The 21st Amendment is the only amendment to the United States Constitution that has ever been passed explicitly to strike down another amendment. So prohibition lasted. It's amazing it lasted that long, but it lasted uh, in the United States for about 13 years. There was a common cartoon uh, used by the temperance movements. Uh, they used many uh, graphics, uh, but I wanted to show you this one. It's called The Drunkard's Progress, uh, and it starts over here with step one, a glass with friends. Uh, step two, a glass to keep the cold out. Step three, a glass too much. Step four, drunk and riotous. Step five, the summit attained drinking with companions in drunkenness. Step six, leading to poverty and disease. Step seven, being forsaken by your friends. Step eight, desperation and crime. And step nine, death by suicide. Oof. This is the common pattern that was witnessed by concerned uh, Westerners, especially Americans and uh, people in England, especially driven by concerned Protestant movements that led to destruction. And their solution was complete abstinence from drinking alcohol. Is that biblical? 
Is that an acceptable Christian ethic? Is that something that the church has supported that holy orthodoxy would uphold? Let me spend just a few minutes uh, talking about that subject. So first we should know that the scriptures themselves uh, are very clear about the use uh, and in some cases required use uh, of alcohol. Yes, in fact, there are, if you read the scriptures carefully, there are many uh, examples of uh, the use of alcohol and a few examples in which God actually requires the use of alcohol. Perhaps the most familiar text uh, to an Orthodox Christian would be the Vesper Psalm, Psalm 103 uh, in the Septuagint, Psalm 104 uh, in uh, Western Bibles, where we read that God causes grass to grow for the cattle and green herb for the service of man to bring forth bread out of the earth and wine to make glad the heart of man. God grants his blessing that the earth might bring forth wine to make glad the heart of man. This is uh, in the context of this incredible creation psalm of how the Lord stewards in his providence all the different aspects of creation in order to be a great blessing to man. And wine is front and central, front and central. We also see other examples, for instance, the required use of wine and in fact other alcoholic beverages in the offerings that were required in the Old Testament. You can read this in Exodus chapter 29. You see the, the use of wine as a gift between righteous persons. Just think of the exchange between uh, the holy patriarch Abraham and the incredible priest king Melchizedek, uh, in which Melchizedek gave to Abraham wine. In fact, wine is used by the prophets as a sign of messianic blessing, and it's used by Moses in the Pentateuch. The, re the withdrawal of wine, the disappearance of wine, uh, is a covenantal curse, something that God brings upon his people when they are, in fact, disobedient. So we see, in fact, that references to wine and alcoholic beverages literally permeate the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. So, how is it with this scriptural testimony that it would be an appropriate ethic for Christians to abandon the use of wine completely? Let me just address that a little bit. There is a principle in ethics that we should uh, affirm at this moment. And the principle is abuse does not nullify proper use. Because some people take the gifts of God and in disrespect to him, misuse those gifts in order to further sinful ways to actually advance the devil's work. And in this case, they take the gift of wine, but they drink it without temperance, without moderation, and become drunk. And in that state, under the inspiration of chemicals, having driven the Holy Spirit away from them, no longer wishing to be inspired by him, but to be inspired by chemicals and drink, they do terrible things. That abuse does not nullify the proper God-given use of wine. This is the ethical principle. And in fact, this is what we see our Lord Jesus Christ and the apostles modeling. The Lord Jesus himself drank wine moderately, even though he knew he would be accused of being an abuser of wine. And in fact, he was. He was accused of being a drunkard. But that did not stop him from modeling temperance and proper human behavior to enjoy the gifts of God. He himself moderately drank wine, as did the apostles. St. Paul, in fact, counseled his spiritual son, St. Timothy, to take a little wine. He knew that it had tremendous benefits, especially medicinal properties that might help St. Timothy's bad stomach. Jesus also chose to bring wine, the most glorious, heaven-created, miraculous wine that, that any person has ever tasted. Uh, he, the Lord brought forth wine from water as his first great sign in John chapter 2 at the wedding feast of Cana and Galilee. And that action has led the church to bless the common cup of wine at weddings to this day. We give to drink uh, of sweet wine to newly crowned uh, husbands and wives in, in the wedding service. Jesus also used wine at the mystical supper and ordained that 
wine itself would, by the descent of the Holy Spirit, become the miraculous uh, means of communing in his very blood, that he would take wine and turn it into his precious blood for our salvation so that we could literally eat his flesh and drink his blood. No wine, no Eucharist, no salvation. Even those who promoted prohibition in the United States in 1920 were wise enough to uh, protect the use uh, of wine in religious services. So we see, in fact, that the model for us uh, is not the model of total abstinence. Teetotalism is improperly named. It is not total temperance because temperance is not abstinence. What teetotalism is, is total abstinence. And I find it extremely interesting. Uh, that though many religious groups have embraced this principle uh, of total abstinence, from Hinduism to Islam to various forms of Protestant Christianity in the Methodist tradition, the Nazarenes, the Seventh-day Adventists, uh, various forms of conservative Baptists, uh, these religious groups have embraced these things, but I find it extremely interesting that they haven't applied that same definition of temperance, which they're translating as total abstinence, to other appetites that lead to misery. How about the appetite for sex? It, on their principle, there, if we are to avoid the miseries that flow from the misuse of sex, then we would be able to eradicate abortion immediately. We would be able to eradicate adultery immediately. We would be er able to eradicate venereal disease immediately simply by practicing not total temperance, but what teetotalers promote, which is total abstinence. Those same teetotalers I don't see arguing that human beings due to the misery of misused sex should stop having sex altogether. They're inconsistent in their application of a bogus ethic. For us, temperance is a cardinal virtue. Temperance or moderation is one of the fundamental virtues that the church sets forth together with justice and wisdom and courage. Those virtues are the foundations upon which we build a, a, a house of virtue, a house of godliness and holiness pleasing to the Lord. Temperance is not total abstinence. Temperance is that virtue that allows us to regulate uh, our appetites in such a way that they serve the ends that we have to serve God and to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. This means that we learn uh, when and how to satisfy our, our, our appetites in a moderate way that brings glory to God and health to the human being. This is uh, the example that Christians also should promote with regards to the use of, of alcohol. Mm. and coffee, and coffee, although don't press me too hard on that. Let me just say a few more things about that. Uh, uh, one is that this celebration of the gift of wine in the church is, is commemorated, uh, especially when we bless vineyards in the priest's prayer book. There is a blessing of vineyards in my priesthood, even though I'm an urbanite, even though I, I live in a cement uh, city and uh, state, almost completely cement near me. I have been able to bless a number of vineyards over the years, and they're always joyous events, joyous events, and a clear sense of being connected to our salvation, the care of these incredible vineyards. We also, on the Holy Feast of the Transfiguration, bless grapes, and in the prayer, remember that it is through these grapes and God's blessing upon them uh, that we are able to bring the fine wine to God, which he then receives from us, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, transmutes into the blood of his Son and gives back to us uh, so that we can have a sweet, saving communion with our Lord Jesus Christ. Teetotalism. Let's choose rather temperate use of the gifts of God. God be with you. Patristic Nectar Publications is pleased to present Antichrists of the 20th Century, a six-part lecture series. The 20th century was the most violent century in human history, as 19th century German Marxism was instituted by violent revolution and thoroughly applied by dictators in many countries around the world, leading to the deaths of more than 100 million people, 
many by execution, starvation, and the gulag, and the gathering into heaven of the largest number of Christian martyrs in church history. These lectures survey the personal lives and ideology of five of the most brutal communist leaders and to offer reflections upon the principles behind their tyranny, principles that continue to threaten the West today and are appearing in mainstream American politics. For these and other available titles, please visit our website at patristicnectar.org.